Hello everybody, so today I have two underwater diving disaster stories. You see, a mistake underwater while diving almost always lead to death. You could plan and prepare for days to go explore underwater, yet still there's a chance that you might not return back to the surface. So in the two stories we have today, you will see exactly that. As usual, viewer discretion is advised. Tim was a 43-year-old technical diver and a dive master with plenty of experience in the sport. He was in good shape and well known by the people in his town as a friendly and kind man. He oftentimes helped boarders at the local marina by cleaning hulls and diving to retrieve lost rudders and lower outboard units in both freshwater river and in the ocean environments. Fast forward to the day of this story. It was a busy weekend on the river marina when a recreational boater collided with another vessel and lost control of his large 40 foot long pressure craft. Within minutes, the boat sunk to the bottom of the river. The people on board had made it to the shore, but the boat had gone down. It was approximately 50 feet down in the freshwater river. When this incident happened, the owner of the marina asked him if he was up to go and take a look at the boat and see whether there are any ways to bring it back to the surface. Before that, a local commercial diver had already agreed to do the job, but he wasn't available that day, plus his price was too high. So that's when marina's owner had asked Tim to do the job. Tim had never tried to raise a boat as large as this one from the riverbed before. The biggest thing he had ever dealt with was boat engines. But despite that, Tim happily accepted the job for half the price that the other diver had wanted to charge. He decided to start the retrieval of the boat the following morning. So the day before that, he planned the mission. He knew he had to make quite a lot of dives back and forth. He first would have to make several dives to place the lift bags on the board. Second, he would have to make a few more to fill them all and then also bring the board to the shore. He asked a bunch of friends also to come and help him with the equipment. They agreed and yeah, everything was going smoothly. In a flash, that day passed and the next morning came. The day of the boat retrieval. Before getting started with the main dives, equipment and everything else, Tim decided to go on a survey dive and check out the boat's condition and the environment around it. Plus, he would be able to determine how many leaf bags he would need. Since it was only to take a look, Tim didn't ask for anyone to come along with him. You see, the boat had sunk out of the main shipping channel and therefore the area was marked with the boy to warn the other boaters to stay away. So before Tim began his descent to the seabed, he geared up on the shore and swam straight from the river bank to the boy. Normally you would use another boat and a few more people to stay on the boat while you are on the dive. But like I said, Tim didn't bring anyone with him for the very first dive of that day. Before he swam straight downward, he placed a diver down flag on top of the marker boy and then the journey began. He used an underwater scooter to navigate his way against the river current and get back to his exit point. So with that, he descended to the river bed where the boat was. He spent a good amount of time completing his survey of the sunken pleasure craft. He marked location for the lift bags on an underwater slate that he had carried with him. So now, almost done with the dive, and the hull against the riverbed was the only thing left to be checked out. It was a bit difficult to see due to the stirred up silt and mud on the bottom, but he still managed to check it out along with the whole impact area. However, just to make sure, he wanted an even more thorough look, so he held onto the board and turned his scooter around trying to blow the silt and mud out of the way. That way, the water becomes clearer. But all of a sudden, something so unimaginable happened. With no warning, the board rotated and fell onto Tim. He got trapped on the bottom of the river. Everything happened so fast. Most likely, he was facing away from the board when it was rolling toward him. It had taken several hours for anyone from the surface to notice Tim's dive flag. When help was called in, everyone knew that Tim was gone by that point. The local fire department's dive team recovered the corpse, 
By that point, it had been four hours since Tim had begun the dive. It had been found according to his dive computer. God only knows how terrifying and painful those last few minutes must have been. Imagine being trapped somewhere in a small space. That alone is unthinkably horrifying to most people. Tim must have run out of oxygen or even more likely panicked and exhausted himself before he passed out and eventually stopped breathing. What a sad fate. This story actually shows us how unpredictable and scary the underwater environment can be. Carl was a 55-year-old master scuba diver and had a lot of experience in mixed gas diving. If you don't know what mixed gas diving is, it basically means using a specific gas mixture to dive to greater depths. Carl always enjoyed spending a lot of time underwater, which is probably why he became that much more of a pro in the sport. One time, he and his friends planned to dive and explore the hulking shipwreck sprawled across the seabed at a depth of over 200 feet. So they went to the Jersey Shore in New Jersey. This is a well-known diving destination for divers. Similar to Carl, his friends also had a lot of experience in technical diving. So they were confident that the dive was going to be successful. That day, the sea was calm, the weather was good, simply all the conditions were great to explore the wreck. Everyone got on a local charter boat and headed to the destination where they can set off. They had decided to dive on an open circuit system. It is simply the use of a traditional breathing apparatus known as a regulator. Unlike closed circuit, the gas you breathe underwater does not get recycled. So, you will have to bring a lot of gas cylinders to use for the whole time that you spend underwater. Not only that, depending on the depth, you have to use a specific mixture of gas. In other words, each air tank has different gas mixtures and that's what Carl and his team also carried with them. One for the descent, another for the time spent at the seabed and another for the ascent. Basically, they would switch to different air tanks with each part of the dive. The tanks were also attached to its own regulators. In technical diving, open circuit system is not used as frequently as the closed circuit. But with the experience Carl and his friends have, they probably can manage. So with that, everybody got to the location via the boat and then they set off. About halfway into the dive, something went wrong. Carl quickly swam to his body in a rush and pointed to his regulator. His body was shocked at what he saw. Carl's regulator was out of his mouth and free-flowing. Carl then pointed over his shoulders, signaling to his friends to turn off the valve connected to the tank with the malfunctioning regulator. His body quickly shut the valve, but that wasn't enough. On Carl's end, he wasn't quick enough. He couldn't immediately switch to his backup regulator on his other tank. The situation went from 0 to 100 in a matter of seconds. Carl panicked. The friend who was closest to Carl tried to give his extra regulator, but Carl was out of it. He seemed to have given up. He looked at the new regulator he was given as if it was also malfunctioning. Panic leads to carbon dioxide poisoning and that makes you lose all your senses. You then act irrational. The friend who earlier tried to give the regulator could see the true panic in Carl's eyes. All of Carl's other friends also knew what was happening, and yet they couldn't do anything. You see, by this point, the group was at a decent depth. If they were to turn back and rush to the surface, they all could die, because they had mandatory decompression stops and therefore could not ascend directly to the surface even in an emergency. That means during the ascent, every diver must stop a few times along the way to decompress, Otherwise, they would develop a condition called decompression sickness and face a lot of fatal consequences. So due to that, everyone was helpless, not being able to do anything. And just like that, right before their eyes, Carl lost his consciousness. His friend tried to force the regulator into his mouth, but seconds later, the friend also knew that Carl wasn't breathing and that the regulator was of no use at that point. Nonetheless, they couldn't just do nothing. They wanted to do something, so they made the decision to at least try. And what they did was interesting. 
They added air to Carl's dry suit and jettisoned some of his weights to make him positively buoyant. That was the only way to send Carl to the surface as quickly as possible. If the boat crew spot him floating on the water, they could try resuscitating him. At least that was the plan. And just like that, it worked. The boat crew spotted Carl on the surface and brought him on board, but their attempts to save him were unsuccessful. An unfortunate turn of events. See, nothing significant or hazardous happened. It was just a little mistake that led Carl to his death. All the training, experience and knowledge he had in the sport weren't enough. So that day, Carl passed away. Alright guys, with that we have got to the end of both stories and also the video. I hope you enjoyed and even learned something from these stories. So thank you for watching and if you like my content, please consider subscribing to my channel. Alright guys, that's all for this video and with another story, I will see you guys soon. Until then, stay safe out there and goodbye.